Thank you for watching. My name is Dexter Bradford. I'm an attorney here at Beresford Booth. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about a short subject, but that's very important if you're a business owner. And that is, what is the joint employer rule? And the joint employer rule, if you have to sum it up in, in a couple of lines, you could say that it's just two or when two or more businesses uh, are considered to be employers of the same employee. Seems pretty straightforward. The important thing is that each employer can be held liable for wage and hour claims or any other employment violations of that employee. And it seems to go without saying that you could have an employee that could be working at two different places. But the joint employer rule actually says that even if that employee is not an employee of your business, it's still possible that you could be liable for wage and hour claims and or other employment violations of that employee. So it's a very important one to know if you're a business owner uh, and you can help avoid a lot of uh, potential liability if you're aware of this rule and if you keep your eyes out for it. So the joint employer rule follows what's called the economic realities test. This is how we determine whether or not you are going to be determined to be a joint employer of a particular employee. The court will use this. It's a non-exclusive list of factors, which makes it a bit difficult to determine at times because it's a long list. But if you go through this long list and you find that any of these are applicable, there's a good shot that you are likely to be considered a joint employer. So here's what's actually considered. The nature and degree and control of the workers, amongst a lot of other things, including how much supervision you have over them, your power to determine their pay rates, if you can hire and fire them, uh, whether they're using equipment on your premises or they're bringing their own sort of equipment, whether their job has a particular time line, timeline or whether you're preparing their payroll. There's quite a few things on this list, but the important, the most important one to remember is, is probably the first one here, is if you have control over an employee in any way that a traditional employer would not or would, then you're probably a joint employer. So how does this actually play out in practice? Um, it, it can actually cause a, a significant bit of risk for you as an employer, because once you're actually deemed a joint employer, again, you're potentially liable for any wage and hour violations. So if you if you want to break this down into, well, how does this actually look in practice? What sort of hypothetical situations uh, arise? And what's the even the purpose of this law? We can discuss a uh, you know, quick hypothetical. Let's say you own two restaurants. You own them in separate entities. You have uh, Joe's Pizza and John's Cafe. And I'm the single owner of, of both Joe's Pizza and John's Cafe. I have an employee that works at both places, but they're only an employee of Joe's Pizza. I have an employment agreement that says, hey, you are an employee of Joe's Pizza. You can work at my pizza shop. And let's say me as the owner of Joe's Pizza say, hey, employee, uh, why don't you just start working at John's Cafe as well? You know, you're still a Joe's employee pizza, but go do some shifts over at John's Cafe. Uh, you know, I'll pay you at the same same rate that you would at Joe's Pizza. And I have that employee work 30 hours a week at Joe's Pizza and another 30 hours a week at John's Cafe. Now, I, as the employer, am a joint employer uh, because I own both Joe's Pizza and John's Cafe. Both Joe's Pizza and John's Cafe are liable for this employee's, making sure this employee is properly paid under wage and hour laws. And so the purpose of this, part of the purpose of this rule is to help uh, prevent this situation where an employer has an employee working at one place for 30 hours a week and then working at another or maybe a similar job uh, and saying, uh, you're going to work 30 hours here, you're going to work 30 hours there, but we'll, we'll keep you as a, a separate employee or, you know, of, of John's Cafe and John's Pizza so that way we don't have to pay you overtime. Doesn't matter if the employee is both an employee of Joe's Pizza and of John's Cafe. I own both of them. I control the employee. I get to dictate when and how they work, and I'm the one paying them. 
So I'm liable, whether it's Joe's Pizza or whether it's John's Cafe, to make sure that they're paid overtime for all the hours that they work. So in any any excess of, of 40 hours as employees working, doesn't matter where it's at, if it's at the cafe or at the pizza place, I'm a joint employer because I own both businesses and I get to control the, how the employee is working. I have the control over the employee. If you look at another one, let's say hypothetically here, you own a company, we'll call them G-Mobile. You're a big communications company. Uh, this hypo helps demonstrate how this might arise uh, in issues with, with contractors and maybe even subcontractors. So we're, we're G-Mobile, big communications company. We hire a company called uh, let's, Traffic Stoppers. They're gonna provide traffic control during a construction project. Say we're building a, a cell tower or something like that, and it requires that we do some construction work through a main public road. So we hire Traffic Stoppers. We say, hey, Traffic Stoppers, we need you to come out here and direct traffic while we do this construction project. Right, so they come out and they do this this traffic stopping, and then they have the guys with the, you know, turning the stop signs, and they're out there turning the stop signs. Now, G Mobile is not paying traffic stoppers employees, the people out there turning the signs, and uh, doesn't have the right to fire them, doesn't have the authority to do much else other than it does have the authority uh, to stop work if traffic stoppers workers are not acting safely. So, in this hypothetical, let's say you have uh, a couple of traffic stoppers workers who are not fo uh, following guidelines and they're not acting safely. They're breaching some sort of uh, safety codes. I, as G-Mobile, am actually liable for those employees' violations. If those employees, even though they're not an employee of G-Mobile, I, I don't pay their salary as G-Mobile. I don't have the power to fire them. But if that employee, uh, breaches any sort of safety code because I had the ability to stop work if he breached any sort of safety code, then I'm liable for any uh, damages or any sort of uh, penalties that are incurred uh, because of that employee that employee's violation. So the joint employer rule is a is a tricky little rule that can come up when you least suspect it. So what you should you as an employer do? Well, first, consider if your business has any employees or contractors that could possibly create a joint employment relationship. Also, probably consider updating your agreements with your contractors. A lot of the stuff that you could put in your agreement might be able to shift liability towards the contractor and specifically contract and say, you contractor are going to be liable if traffic stoppers employee breaches any of these safety codes. Um, and then, of course, if you have any other questions about this, if you're not sure whether an employee uh, would qualify under this or whether you are going to be a joint employer. Any specific questions, give us a call at uh, 425-776-4100. Happy to talk to you about joint employer rules all day long. Anyway, thank you for watching. It was a short one, but it, hopefully it was a good one, hopefully a little educational.